Hi there, uh, my name's Will Gangster, and I'm going to be talking about why going hybrid doesn't solve the freight geach problem. Uh, so those of you who have had your ears to the ground in the metaethics literature will know that in the last 15 years or so, a new kind of expressivism has emerged, uh, which is called hybrid expressivism, or ecumenical expressivism, or relational expressivism, uh, as defended most prominently by Michael Ridge and Timo Toppinen. Now, hybrid expressivism has a reputation as a kind of expressivism 2.0, a new and improved version of the outdated traditional pure express expressivism prototype that enjoys the advantages of the view, but without at least some of its major shortcomings. And the parade case for hybrid expressivism here has really been the Frege Geach problem. This is something that pure expressivists have struggled with for the best part of a century, but hybrid expressivists claim to be able to solve it on the cheap using a strategy that I'll be calling the simple offloading strategy. So what I'm gonna argue now is that the simple offloading strategy does not suffice to solve the Frege Geach problem. And so hybrid expressivists have not shown that they can solve the Frege Geach problem. So here's the plan. First, I'm gonna explain what hybrid expressivism is. Then I'm gonna explain what the simple offloading strategy is. And then I'm gonna explain why the simple offloading strategy doesn't work. Okay, moral judgments, as we know, have both belief-like features and desire-like features. So on the one hand, they can be true or false, they can constitute knowledge, they can feature in rational inferences. On the other hand, uh, you know, your moral judgments reliably track what you're motivated to do, uh, they're affect-laden, and substantive moral disagreements can persist in the face of, uh, you know, agreement on all the non-moral facts. And this leads to a familiar puzzle about the nature of moral judgments, right? So pure cognitivists will say that a moral judgment is just a belief and a belief that's not composed even in part by a desire-like attitude. So the pure cognitivist will be able to explain the belief-like features of moral judgments, but will struggle to explain the desire-like features. On the other hand, the pure expressivist says that a moral judgment is a desire-like attitude of some kind and one that's not composed even in part by a belief. So the pure expressivist will be able to explain the desire-like features of moral judgments but will struggle to explain the belief-like features. So in recent years, there's been a growing interest in what I'll call hybridism, which is the view that a moral judgment is a hybrid state composed in part by a belief, what we'll call the belief component, and in part by a desire-like attitude of some kind, what we'll call the desire component. And the idea is just that you might be able to explain the belief-like features of moral judgments in terms of the belief component of the hybrid state, and the desire-like features in terms of the desire component of the hybrid state. So just to get the distinction a bit clearer, here's our moral agent. Uh, she's judged that lying is wrong. That's a moral judgment she's made. And the disagreement is about the nature of that mental state. So the pure cognitivist says that that's just a belief with moral content, namely the belief that lying is wrong. The pure expressivist says uh, that it's a desire-like attitude of some kind. For example, disapproval of lying. What the hybridist says is that it's a hybrid state composed of two uh, mental states. Um, on the one hand, the belief, for example, the belief that lying is F. And on the other hand, a desire-like attitude of some kind, for example, disapproval of things that are F. And these two things together constitute the moral judgment that lying is wrong. Where F here, is a descriptive property of some kind. And hybrid expressivists at least will say that, uh, will normally say that the value of F can actually vary between agents. So for the committed consequentialist, um, the judgment that lying is wrong might be realized by the belief that lying fails to maximize utility, along with disapproval of things that fail to maximize utility. Whereas for the committed Kantian deontologist, uh, the very same moral judgment might be realized by the belief that lying uh, violates the categorical imperative and disapproval of things that violate the categorical imperative. Okay, now uh, hybridism itself comes in uh, two different kinds, and this will be the last bit of definition mongering we do. So um, that's hybrid cognitivism, which is hybridism along with the claim that it's necessarily the case that a moral judgment is true if and only if its belief component is true. So the truth conditions of a moral judgment, that is the truth conditions of a hybrid state, are identical to 
the truth conditions of its belief component. Hybrid expressivism, the view we're interested in here, is hybridism along with the denial of that claim. So it's not necessarily the case that a moral judgment is true just in case its belief component is true. So to hammer this home, um, hybrid expressivism is distinguished from hybrid cognitivism by their commitment to what we'll call anti-cognitivism, namely that the truth of the belief component of a moral judgment is neither necessary nor sufficient for the truth of the hybrid state as a whole. Now this commitment, anti-cognitivism, is going to be important for our purposes later. So just to make it as clear as possible, I've got a couple of examples. Uh, so say our moral agent is Connie the consequentialist, who thinks that lying is wrong, and her moral judgment is realized by uh, the belief that lying fails to maximize utility, along with disapproval of actions that fail to maximize utility. Now let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that lying doesn't, in fact, fail to maximize utility. So the belief component of Connie's hybrid state is false. She believes that it fails to maximize utility when it doesn't do so. Now let's suppose that um, a kind of Kantian deontology is uh, the right first order moral theory. So actions are wrong just in case they violate the categorical imperative. And let's suppose that lying does in fact violate the categorical imperative, from which it follows that lying is wrong. And so Connie's moral judgment that lying is wrong is in fact true. Now using true here in a purely disquotational sense. So her moral judgment is true despite the fact that its belief component is false. So the truth of the belief component isn't necessary for the truth of the hybrid state as a whole. Now let's vary our supposition slightly. Uh, so let's say that, say that lying does in fact fail to maximize utility. So the belief component of Connie's hybrid state is true. Uh, let's carry on supposing that Kantian deontology is right, but suppose instead that lying doesn't in fact violate the categorical imperative, from which it follows that lying is not wrong. So Connie's moral judgment is false, uh, again, in a purely disquotational sense. Um, she thinks that lying is wrong, but in fact, lying is not wrong. So her judgment is false, the hybrid state is false, despite the fact that its belief component is true. So the truth of the belief component isn't sufficient for the truth of the moral judgment as a whole either. So that's just to hammer home here um, that the distinctive commitment of hybrid expressivism as such is that the truth of the hybrid state, um, sorry, the truth of the belief component of a hybrid state is neither necessary nor sufficient for the truth of the hybrid state as a whole. Okay, so that's what hybrid expressivism is. I'm now going to explain how hybrid expressivists try to solve the Frege Geach problem. So there's many ways to try and characterize the Frege Geach problem. Um, but one way of thinking about it is this uh, it's the problem of trying to explain the logico semantic properties of moral sentences uh, in terms of the mental states uh, that they express. Um, and in particular, the difficulty of doing so uh, if you're an expressivist who thinks that the um, mental states expressed by moral sentences are desire like attitudes of some kind. So by logico-semantic properties, um, I just mean things like this. Um, the fact that uh, P is logically inconsistent with not P. Uh, that's a fact about those sentences. It's the type of thing we want our semantic or meta-semantic theory to explain. Uh, likewise, a very familiar case from discussions of the frege geach problem. Um, P and if P then Q together logically entail Q, or to put it another way, the argument from P and if P then Q to Q is logically valid. That again is something that we would want our semantic or metasemantic theory to explain. Now, expressivists are committed to explaining the logico semantic properties of moral sentences in terms of the mental states they express, hence the name expressivism. But it turns out to be difficult to carry out this task if you think that moral sentences express desire like attitudes. Ironically, it wouldn't be that difficult if you were a cognitivist, right? So here's something the cognitivist can say. She can say, well, hang on, my face is going to get in the way here. Um, she can say that lying is wrong expresses the belief that lying is wrong. Uh, that lying is not wrong expresses the belief that lying is not wrong. And these beliefs are inconsistent with each other um, in virtue of being, in virtue of having inconsistent contents and beliefs with inconsistent contents are inconsistent. So here we can explain the inconsistency of the sentences in terms of the inconsistency of the beliefs they express 
which is in turn explained in terms of the inconsistency of the contents of those beliefs. So we could explain why the sentences are inconsistent in terms of um, the mental states they express if we thought they expressed beliefs. Um, but that task turns out to be much more difficult if you think they express desire-like attitudes. So for the pure expressivist, you might say something like, lying is wrong expresses disapproval of lying. But then it's not clear what mental state you're gonna say lying is not wrong expresses. Um, it can't be disapproval of not lying because then you'd make lying is not wrong equivalent to not lying is wrong. Um, and those are clearly distinct judgments. And whatever state you say the negation expresses here, um, the kind of inconsistency between disapproval of lying and that state will not be the familiar kind of inconsistency in content um, that the cognitivist would be entitled to. So it looks like to explain why these sentences are inconsistent with each other, the expressivist is gonna to have to appeal to a different kind of clash between attitudes. And it's been contentious whether or not um, she can do so. Now this is, um, I'm just, just focusing on negation in particular, but these kinds of problems uh, generalize to explaining logico semantic properties of moral sentences in general. Uh, now there's been a lot of literature on this, and of course, pure expressivists have tried to solve the Frege Geach problem, but it's, at the very least very contentious um, whether or not they can do so. Um, so it's striking then that hybrid expressivists claim to be able to solve the problem quite easily. Um, and their strategy for doing so is just this. I mean, we've seen that the cognitivist um, could solve the frege geek problem by appealing, explaining the logical semantic properties of moral sentences in terms of the same properties of moral beliefs. But hybrid expressivists think that um, moral sentences express hybrid states with belief components. So their strategy for solving the frege geach problem is to try and appeal to the logico-semantic properties of the belief components of the hybrid states. Um, so the hybrid expressivist, in Ridge's words, uh, tries to offload the explanation of the logico-semantic properties of moral sentences onto the belief components of the hybrid states they express. So in slightly more detail, um, the hybrid expressivist strategy, this, what I'll call the simple offloading strategy, consists of two steps. So step one, we give a compositional explanation of which hybrid states are expressed by logically complex sentences. That sounds complicated, but the idea I think is pretty simple. So if we've got our atomic sentence here, lying is wrong, that expresses a hybrid state composed of the belief that lying is F and disapproval of things that are F, for example. So what state is expressed by its negation? Well, it's also a hybrid state, the belief component of which is the negation of the belief component uh, of the hybrid state expressed by the atomic sentence that it negates. So the belief that lying is not F is just the negation of the belief that lying is F. A prime is the negation of A. Uh, and the desire-like component is just the very same desire-like component. Uh, and this strategy will kind of, so what, what we do here is we kind of push all the logical complexity into the belief components of the hybrid states. So here, here we've seen it here for negation, but you know, for a conjunction of two moral sentences, uh, that will express a hybrid state, um, the belief component of which is the conjunction of the belief components of the hybrid states expressed by the conjuncts. It's kind of wordy to say that explanation, but I think the idea is um, clear enough. So that's the first step. And the second step is then to explain the logico-semantic properties of uh, moral sentences in terms of the logico-semantic properties of the belief components of the hybrid states they express. So why are lying is wrong and lying is not wrong inconsistent? Well, uh, their belief the belief components of the hybrid states they express are inconsistent. And that's why the sentences themselves are inconsistent. So that seems like a powerful strategy. Um, and it has indeed been taken to be so. Um, but I don't think it works, and here, here's why it doesn't work. What, what goes wrong? Well, the problem is with step two. So the simple offloading strategy says that lying is wrong is inconsistent with lying is not wrong, belief, because the belief component of the hybrid state that lying is wrong expresses is inconsistent with the belief component of the hybrid state that lying is not wrong expresses. But recall anti-cognitivism. The truth of the belief component of a hybrid state is neither necessary nor sufficient for the truth of the hybrid state as a whole. 
So it simply doesn't follow from the fact that the hybrid states have inconsistent belief components that the hybrid states themselves cannot both be true. That would follow if the truth of the belief component was necessary and sufficient for the truth of the hybrid state as a whole. But that is explicitly what hybrid expressivists reject. It's the defining commitment of hybrid expressivism as such. So for all that's been said, it could be the case that lying is wrong and lying is not wrong express consistent judgments. They express judgments with inconsistent belief components, but it doesn't follow from that that the, that the hybrid states themselves are inconsistent. And of course, if lying is wrong and lying is not wrong express consistent judgments, which could be the case for what's been said, then, it would be mis then it's mysterious why those sentences are inconsistent with each other. And of course, that's gonna generalize to other logico-semantic properties, right? Uh, because of anti-cognitivism, in general, we don't have any reason to think that the logico-semantic properties of the hybrid states moral sentences expressed will track the logico-semantic properties of their belief components in the way that the simple offloading strategy requires. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the objection. Um, I might edit this out later, but in case I've got time, uh, what's gone wrong? Um, well, I think we need to be careful to distinguish two different things. So um, there's what I'll call agential inconsistency for negation, which is the fact that someone who accepts P and not P at the same time is being inconsistent. And attitudinal inconsistency for negation, uh, which is that the mental state expressed by P is inconsistent with the mental state expressed by not P. So those sound similar, right? But the first is a property of an agent who accepts two judgments. The second is a property of the attitudes expressed by two sentences. Now, normally we'd explain agential inconsistency in terms of attitudinal inconsistency. Why is it that someone who accepts both those sentences is being inconsistent? Well, because those sentences express attitudes that are inconsistent. And someone who accepts inconsistent attitudes is being inconsistent. But those two things come apart for the hybrid expressivist. So hybrid expressivists can explain uh, Jin, the property of the agents, um, because the belief components of the hybrid states are inconsistent with each other. So someone who accepts them both is being inconsistent. But because of anti-cognitivism, this property of the agents can, in principle, come apart from the property of the attitudes. The fact that the agent, um, we, so the fact that the someone who accepts both those attitudes at the same time as being inconsistent doesn't suffice for the attitudes themselves to be inconsistent. Uh, because the truth of the belief component is neither necessary nor sufficient for the truth of the hybrid state as a whole. And without this attitudinal property, it's mysterious why the sentences that express those states are inconsistent with each other. So I think we can see this clearly um, in a quote from Ridge, which I'll conclude with. So Ridge um, tries to define validity as follows. He says an argument is valid just in case any possible believer who accepts all of the premises but at one and the same time denies the conclusion would thereby be guaranteed to have inconsistent beliefs. But the inconsistent beliefs there are the um, belief components of the hybrid states. So that just defines sentential validity in terms of what I've called agential inconsistency. But as we know, right, that the belief components of the hybrid states cannot be true together doesn't entail that the hybrid states cannot be true together. So we don't have attitudinal inconsistency here. We merely have agential inconsistency. And without attitudinal inconsistency, the explanation is incomplete. So note that the objection here is not one of extensional adequacy. It might be extensionally adequate, but it's clearly explanatorily inadequate. Okay, so to conclude, the simple offloading strategy doesn't suffice to solve the frege geach problem. Um, and it's scuppered by anti-cognitivism, which is an essential commitment of hybrid expressivism as such. I note that I haven't argued that hybrid expressivism constitutes no advance at all on pure expressivism. In fact, I think that's not so because the hybrid expressivist at least has a nice compositional story to tell about which states are expressed by complex sentences. And certainly not all kinds of pure expressivism can do that. Um, I have also only argued that hybrid expressivists haven't solved the frege geach problem. I haven't argued that they can't solve it. In fact, in work in progress with um, my colleague Graham Bex Priestley, um, we show how we think it can be done. But uh, 
that comes with a disclaimer. It doesn't involve any minor amendment. In fact, what we argue is that it requires reconceptualizing what it is to solve the Frege Geach problem. So it's going to take a rather radical shift of perspective, in our view, for the hybrid expressivist to be able to solve the Frege Geach problem. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs>